Let us pray. Holy One, Holy One, you come to us in ways that we can't even understand, imagine, or fathom. We pray this day that the story of this woman would have deep meaning for us and help us to better understand our faith, our lives, and to better understand you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. What would you do? What would you do if you were, you know, out for a walk and you came across a bottle? Kind of looked like a, there might be, you know, if you thought about it, you know, there might be a genie in that bottle. And before you know it, the genie pops out of the bottle and asks you and offers you whatever you want. Your wish is my command. What would you ask for? What is it you want? What do you hope for more than anything else in life? I think the answer to that question depends on what's going on in your life at that moment. To me, the most surprising part of this story today about the Shunammite woman, unnamed, but her story so powerful, the most surprising part of this story is how she answers that question. This woman, the Shunammite woman, a woman from the northern part of the divided kingdom of the people of Israel, and the prophet Elisha, who this woman had made a house for, a, a room for, so that he could, to ease his burden, this great act of hospitality, to ease this burden of this man who she perceived had a special relationship with God. And she built this place for him. And so in an act of gratitude for that hospitality, Elisha has Gehazi go to her and much like a genie would ask, he asked, what may be done for you? Her answer is not the answer that I would give. Her answer is basically, and this is, it's not 100% clear in the translation, but there are translations and the words can work this way. She basically says, don't worry about me, I'm good. I'm surrounded by my own people, I have all I need. Well, the prophet and, and Gehazi, they think, what about having a son? She doesn't have a son. Surely she'll want that. Her response, please, sir, do not tease me. My husband is old. Please. Don't make such a promise if you don't mean it. Well, the prophet meant it, and she bears a son. Apparently, this prophet Elisha could, who somehow through God could see into her heart, which makes me wonder why she didn't ask. Maybe she didn't know the depth of her own longing, or maybe she Maybe there's another reason. Or did she think it was just too preposterous, presumptuous to ask such a thing? We don't know. We just know that the prophet Elisha, through God, delivers. But of course, that's not the end of the story. The story becomes tragic. The son is out working in the field one day, and he complains of a headache, and he dies. Then, this unnamed woman, very calmly, she says to her husband, I will go right away to see this man of God, Elisha. It will be all right. <laughs> Seriously. Who, 
who reacts this way in such a terrible time to such terrible news? Who has that kind of faith? A couple years after our son Gregory was born, and a couple years before, our daughter Allison was born. And neither Lynn or I, we knew, we didn't know what to say or think or do when twice in fairly short time frame we had miscarriages, two of them, at, a, at 22 months. We didn't know what to say or do or think. This was a time, truthfully, when I was not tending to my faith. And I didn't know where to turn. And we didn't know whether we'd be able to have another child. But our friend here, a Shunammite woman, she knows immediately where she feels she needs to be. And she knows immediately where she needs to turn. God had come through before for her, and she knew exactly where to go, and so she goes to see Elisha. And Gehazi comes out to see her, and he asks, Are things all right? Things all right with your husband, with your child? Are things all right with you? And seemingly calm, <laughs> she says, it is all right. And yet, the next moment, no longer calm. When she sees the prophet himself, Elisha, she falls at his feet, no doubt in tears grabbing on to his feet for dear life. We, I feel, and I, and, and I hope you do too, I feel privileged to be a witness to this sort of dance of faith and all of its complexity in this story. We see her great confidence. Things will be all right. And at the Next thing we know, she's on her on the ground, grabbing on, holding on for dear life. All the while, she's insisting that Elisha, not just Gehazi, that Elisha go to see her boy. She was not going to go without him. Now, we know from the story that Gehazi, when he makes this effort to heal the boy that doesn't work. And so maybe we're left a little bit, and the reading kind of implies it, we're left a little bit to wonder, is it because he didn't pray? Because when the prophet Elisha gets there, the first thing he does is pray, and then he does sort of a resuscitation, and, and the boy comes to life. Regardless of what we think about the reasons, it is a true resurrection beyond our understanding and beyond easy explanation. And the story ends with the mother clinging to, again, once again, clinging to Elisha's feet. Not in desperation this time, but in gratitude. The same thing, grabbing his feet this time in gratitude. There was a movie a few years back. It's called Breakthrough. It's about a true story. And in it, a teenage boy is out with his buddies on some frozen ice, and he falls through. And he's under the water, the frozen water, for a pretty long time. And then he's eventually rescued. But he's barely alive. He's in coma. Even that was a miracle. And his mother, this woman of deep faith, she prays and she prays and she prays. And it's, 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 it's bold prayer. It's actually, she de she's demands, demands of God a miracle. But the mother 
also eventually, as things are fairly plateaued, she has her own sort of breakthrough moment. And she decides that while she's going to continue praying and asking, she's going to stop demanding. And instead, she decides to trust in God's love, trusting that somehow things will be all right, whatever the outcome. Maybe I wonder if that's a lot like the faith we're witness to today in this Shunammite woman. She's strong and she's calm. And she's also demanding of Elisha. But then she has moments of absolute desperation and panic as well. Complicated. Maybe that's a good description of the life of faith. That we're allowed our moments of panic. But ultimately, it's about trust, regardless of outcome, trusting God. After her, in this movie, after her breakthrough moment, she has this change of attitude that becomes evident in the way she, she deals with the people around her, including the doctors and her husband, too. I won't tell you the end of the movie. You'll have to see it. Here's what I know from personal experience. My life, my entire outlook on life, it improved when I came back to the Lord 25, about 25 years ago. But at the same time, that didn't mean that Moments of being down or questioning and maybe even panic. That those moments didn't just like disappear. But what I found is that when I remember what God has throughout my life, one way or another, through ups and downs, the things that God has done for me, including the simplest of things, just being a child of God. It's then that I'm able to regain this sense of confidence that things will be okay regardless of the outcome. When I trust that God has my back somehow. And here's the thing. When I remember that, I'm happier, even though many things may still hang in the balance. And I remember the kind of God that we worship, the God of the Bible, a God who promises that help is on the way in some way. My trust in that, it lifts my entire being. Whole new attitude. And I find that I'm better able to deal with stress and disappointment and anger and and frustration and even moments of despair. And I also find that I'm kinder with the people around to the people around me, just like what Andrea was saying in her children's moment. I'm more aware of the people around me. Friends, we worship a God who brings back life. A God who brings back life literally, as in Christ on the cross, spiritually, of course, physically, sometimes, and unpredictably, and eternally, ultimately. And when we trust that somehow all, that all will be well, that it will be all right, our lives change immediately And life becomes more joyful and more hopeful when we trust that God doesn't abandon us now or ever. That God loves us way too much for that. And so, 
I'd like to, there's one more question I think we need to ask in closing. What does it mean to say that it will be all right? As the Shunammite woman says. What does it mean to say it'll be all right? Does it mean that, that, that um, it'll be okay? God has our back. No matter what the outcome, it will be all right. God loves us too much to abandon us. Does it mean something as simple as that? Or does it mean all right? Everything will be right. The, 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 the hopes and the very hopes and our very dreams. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. But I do know this from personal experience. That when we trust that both are within God's power and that God promises this, it changes life immediately and makes us more resilient, more able. Friends, it will be all right. That is God's promise in Christ. Amen.